Now we might be sitting, so we're I have your mic green, so I'll give this to Allie and Allie. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to ProCon at the Pier. This is a free event, it's a one hour debate, so everyone that's milling around here is welcome to come join us. We'd love to have you uh, join in with our second of our uh, three weekly debates here. I'm Tracy De Francesco, I'm the associate editor at ProCon.org. We're a nonprofit based here in Santa Monica. We offer the pros and the cons of controversial issues. We don't take a position on any of the issues, we just want to give you the information you need to make up your own mind and to be informed. So I'd like to thank our partner, the Santa Monica Pier, and our sponsor, the Arthur N. Roop Foundation, for making these events possible. Our mission at ProGun.org is to promote critical thinking and encourage civic engagement. We also think it's really important to model civil discourse, so that's what we're hoping to do here tonight. If you do any posts on social media, please use the hashtag civil discourse. You can see on the sign there if we have any spelling issues. So I think we all have a pretty good idea of what uncivil discourse looks like these days, right? No one here just woke up from a 20-year coma. Uh, what we're going to try to do is model the civil discourse, work towards listening to the other side, and responding thoughtfully. So tonight, we're going to dive into the topic of public education. Is it broken? And if so, how can we fix it? Before, um, if you didn't have a chance to vote before we began, you can fix in your mind right now if you're pro or con on this issue. Does public education need to be fixed? And then afterwards, please stop by and place your vote up on our boards there. So we want to know if you're pro or con before the debate and how intense your opinion is from 1 to 10. We also want to know how you feel after the debate. So we can see, is anyone's mind changing on this? Um, did you feel differently after hearing this information? And our ProCon.org research team is here to answer any questions you have about our organization or how to vote or the debates. We have Natalie here on the camera and Jeff doing the timing and we have Clint on the voting and Kate back here at our booth. And we all spend most of our time inside on the computers building our website so everyone's pretty excited to get outside. So tomorrow night we're going to be addressing the same topic with a panel discussion at USC. And that's why I'd like to introduce now Allie Bissonnette. She's Deputy Director of the Jesse M. Unruh Institute of Politics. She'll talk more about that event and introduce you to our moderator. Great. Yeah, thank you very much, Tracy. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, as Tracy said, I'm Allie. I'm the Deputy Director at the USC Unruh Institute of Politics. I'll be very brief. I just want to say we're really honored to be here partnering with ProCon um, in hosting this series of events. We have a shared mission of promoting civil dialogue and making sure that uh, both sides of an issue are heard. So we're really excited to be working with them on this and we're really excited to be here tonight with our all-star panel. Um, as Tracy mentioned, we do have a panel tomorrow night. Um, these folks will be joined by Micah Ali, who's on the Compton Unified School Board. Um, and you are all welcome to that event as well. And you can find more information on our Unroot Institute website. Um, at this point, I have the pleasure of introducing our wonderful moderator this evening, Maureen Lagan. So Maureen is a former award-winning Bloomberg and PBS reporter. She is now a TED speaker and solo performer. She is a talk show host on um, KGO Radio in San Francisco, and her latest show is Daughter of a Garbage Man, which is getting rave reviews. So we are thrilled to have her here uh, this evening. So Maureen, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Allie. Thank you, folks, for all being here. Last year it was 20 below zero, so we got a really great night. Yeah, you're very fortunate. We're going to have a little light chat about uh, public education. Is it broken, and can, does it need to be fixed? Just a light little topic, like at what age should you learn the word doter? Things like that. <laughs> things like that uh, and civil discourse what is that who knows maybe they'll learn that in school too so there's a future for all of us uh, but we have two guests who will be arguing their points civilly yet passionately and I want to introduce them to you now we have Jason Spencer here to my right he is a principal advisor to the California State Superintendent of Public Instruction he ho you have degrees in sociology political science from Sonoma State and a Master's of Public Administration from USC. He has lobbied for informal science education institutions, and he is a longtime advocate for uh, more arts education and for career tech, which we used to call vocational. So uh, that's good, right? You want that in California schools. This is like the dating game, remember that? Like, hey, I'm too much, okay. So, 
Nick Melvoin. Nick was born and raised uh, on the west side of Los Angeles. He likes long walks on the beach. Um, he is a member of the Los Angeles Unified School District Board of Education. He taught seventh and eighth grades as an English teacher. He has a bachelor's degree from Harvard, a master's in urban education from Loyola Marymount University, and a law degree. He worked um, as a, he worked in civil rights in the Obama administration. That's a good thing, right? And uh, what we I mean, had those. Yeah, we had those. Remember when we had civil rights? Okay, so <laughs> as we were saying, so what we're going to do is. We're going to have about 25 minutes for these gentlemen to debate their points, and then uh, we'll each we'll have an opening statement from each first, and then we'll turn it over to you for any of the questions or, that you may have for them, a question, okay? So, uh, and then we'll wrap this up within an hour. Are you ready to do this? Yeah. All right, so let's begin our opening statements with Nick Melvoy. Great, thank you. Oh, thanks. It's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's hard to think of a more beautiful debate venue. Tomorrow night we're in a basement at USC, so I think this takes the cake. And if you get bored, just look at the sunset. Um, I also feel like I should just kind of drop the mic and not debate, because everyone is pro uh, public education being broken, and if anyone switches to con, I feel like I've failed. But I think, um, not to preempt Jason, but I think we're going to agree actually a lot on the, on the what. Uh, but it's going to be the how, maybe, and the why that we talk about. But um, like Maureen mentioned, I grew up about five minutes that way. And because I grew up about five minutes that way and not about 15 minutes that way, uh, where I ended up teaching, I was the beneficiary of an incredible education. And I say because of, very intentionally, the greatest indicator of a child's success in America today is the zip code that they were born into. Okay, the greatest indicator of success of a child in America today is the zip code that they were born into, not grit, not merit, not work ethic, not even academic achievement. There was a study last year that kids in the top decile of academics, but the bottom decile of wealth, are less likely to graduate from college than kids in the top decile of academics, but the bottom decile of wealth. So you are more likely in this country today to, be, uh, to graduate from college if you are dumb and rich, um, C-E-G, the White House, than if you are poor and brilliant. And that's why I think probably most people agree that this is a broken system, because how can we call that a meritocracy when the greatest indicator of your success is where you were born and not um, who you are? So, you know, if this were the case 100 years ago, I wouldn't be here. I'm sure others wouldn't. I'm the beneficiary of immigrants who, because of public education, succeeded in spite of where they started. Um, and yet, here today in LA, um, about 100% of kids will go to college where I grew up in Brentwood, and only 9% of kids will make it to college where I taught in Watts, and only 3% will graduate. So 97% gap, uh, it's called the achievement gap, it's really an opportunity gap, it separates kids like I was and kids like I taught, and to me that is a broken system. I um, spent my career trying to fix this as a teacher, um, and to go to the, kind of the brokenness, I started teaching in 2008 with a program called Teach for America uh, in Watts. and. Um, came into a school that the year before only 4% of 8th graders were proficient in math and the assistant principal was arrested for sexually assaulting a student. And this was an individual that the district knew about and it was too hard to fire him so they sent him to Watts where they thought people wouldn't notice. And at the end of our first year through some uh, restructuring, started a soccer team, a baseball team, we were the fastest growing school in LUSD and to reward our success we all got laid off. Because the way we lay off teachers in this state is based solely on seniority, last in, first out. So not only are you decimating all these young teachers, flash forward today, we have a teacher shortage, no surprise, um, but it's also very inequitable because our younger teachers are mostly in this hard to staff schools. So for me, understanding that, okay, even if I wanted to teach, I kept getting laid off. And it's also these underserved kids that are really uh, getting the short end of the stick. More had to be done, so went to law school, went to the White House, and then uh, came back and then now, um, on the school board uh, trying to kind of fix the system. So I think our time's up and... Okay, let's hear from Jason Spencer. <laughs> Move the you. audience. Thank you, I will try. Thanks, Nick, and, and again, beautiful venue, and thanks to uh, ProCon and, and USC for the, for the invite. You know, I think Nick really made, you know, made part of the point for me at the beginning. It's not necessarily our public education system that's broken. Public schools work phenomenally in Brentwood. They work phenomenal in Santa Monica. They work phenomenal in Palo Alto. There are very successful public schools um, all across this state. And the greatest indicator of success is your zip code. It is essentially wealth. And the, the greatest indicator of, of, of a child's success in school is the, is the literacy level of their mother. And so it's, it's, it's a system that's 
that's really based on, that is place-based and that is community-based. And if we can, I wouldn't argue that our system is not broken and doesn't need fixing, but I think we need to fix it in different ways. If we are focusing on, on the needs of the whole child, the supports that a community needs to, to provide you know, uh, each student with, with the, the resources, the opportunities, and we talk about the achievement gap, the opportunity gap is, is a way we're framing that at the department as well. If we can really focus on providing students with opportunities at, at, with equity across the system, we can get much closer to, we can, we can close that 90, 97% college gap, which is absolutely true. But again, that, that stems from, from the wealth of the community, from the, the education level of parents, and the public school system is doing everything it can, from my perspective, um, to, serve, uh, to serve students. And, and we see that students in low-income areas have, you know, have much higher needs, much greater needs, than students from wealthier areas. So the, the, the public school system, there are amazing teachers, there are amazing principals across the state. Um, and I've said, you know, said before that if you, uh, o Oakland Hills is a, you know, Oakland is another very interesting place to look at where you have a wealth disparity, the Oakland Hills versus the Flatlands. So Oakland Unified has schools that perform at a very high level, miles from schools that perform at a very low level. And if you took the, the teachers and the principal and the leaders of those schools in, in the wealthier parts of, of Oakland or really anywhere in California, and you traded places with them with the same, you know, the principals and teachers in a school in a, in a low-income neighborhood with challenges and very few opportunities for students, it would be very difficult for those, those school leaders that had success in a wealthy community to have that same success in a low-income community. So the question is, how do we serve the needs of all kids? How do we serve the needs of the whole child? How do we make sure that, sort of from a Maslow's hierarchy perspective, that the basic needs of, a student, of students are met so that they can learn? They feel safe, they feel challenged, they feel supported, they're what fed, they, they have the pieces they need. And that's really a community question that goes so far beyond the classroom and so far beyond just what, what a principal, what a district superintendent, what a school board member, what a teacher can do. If we aren't really looking at all of the resources within our society, within communities, and making sure that we're providing equitable opportunities for, our, for all students, we will never fix what looks like a broken system, but a system that works for many and doesn't work for many. Okay, so what I'm hearing from both of you saying, the zip code is the biggest issue when it comes to children in their schools. So people can't just pick up and move and go, look, I'd love to live in that wealthy house. That's not going to happen. So what then do you see as the first uh, front that you think people need to tackle in order to get well, their education? Well, this is where I think Jason's point 20 years ago maybe holds, but not as much today. Because one, two, two points. One is that 84% of students who live in LAUSD live in poverty. Right, so we're, we're correct, there's a lot of other things we have to do, and I think Jason and I agree about the need to fix healthcare and nutrition. But this trend is, it, it has been increasing in America, and about two years ago we hit for the first time that over 50% of students in public schools are living in poverty. And the answer of the traditional system and its defenders has been, well, we can't educate certain kids if they're poor. And the answer needs to be, actually, we now have a more expansive view of public education. If the New York City school system said in 1896 to my great-grandfather, you can't speak English, you're a Jewish immigrant, you gotta, you gotta go, some, you know, figure that out, uh, we wouldn't be here. And so I think it's incumbent on the school district to say, actually, we need to even be more expansive. And we hit barriers when we do that with the traditional defenders of the status quo, with unions, with others who, who aren't really willing to think expansively. The other things that, that's happened is through the charter school movement and through some of the other reform movements, we have pockets of excellence where it used to be, able, we could say, you know what, in Compton and Watts and Inglewood, it's too hard. Whereas in Brentwood, yes, we have great public schools, but we can't do it in Watts. But now, there are these innovative schools, charter schools, magnet schools, where down the street from a traditional school, 80% of kids are going to college. 70% of kids are passing their tests. Outperforming school. KIPP, which, regardless of zip code. Regardless of zip code. KIPP, uh, which is a charter school network, has this elementary school in Boyle Heights that outperforms Pacific Palisades Elementary. And instead of saying, how do we get more of those, the defenders of the status quo have said that they're doing something special. They, they don't have unions or they're, you know, and my response is let's, let's make more of those, let's figure out what they're doing well and replicate them as opposed to just continuing to say, oh, until we fix all these other things that we agree we need to fix, schools are just going to be mildly okay. Well, I am hearing the union come up as an issue, but how, first, how do you respond to that? I mean, I think in, and I would agree with parts of that. I think just so I'm not labeled as someone defending the status quo, I think that's, 
one of the, the key pieces. There are pockets of excellence in, in charter schools, in magnet schools, which are traditional district public schools, and in traditional schools across the board. The, the challenge that I see and the problem is that we haven't yet realized the vision of the charter school movement from 20 plus years ago that was to be, they were to be innovation incubators. They were to, to seed the rest of the public school system with those successful strategies and practices. But we've created a, a system in the state where instead of, it, instead of incentivizing collaboration between the, the reformers, the innovators, and the traditional public school system, we've set up this system of competition where it's it's a battle for students, a battle for dollars, and a um, and, and really we just set up a system that's that's looking at competition based on folks that aren't playing by the same rules, right? So charter schools have they have flexibility, they intentionally, right? We gave them flexibility so they could try things out and innovate, but they're not playing. But traditional public schools are not playing by the same rules. Why well, can't they? Well, that was going to be my that's, response too. That's and one exactly of the reasons the question. I ran for the school board and not starting charter schools. I never worked in a, I worked in a traditional district school. Is that I hear that a lot. It's not fair because charter schools don't play that same rules. And I'm glad Jason kind of preempted the, my next point, which is that's the point. The rules haven't been working. The rules are broken. We have this new set of rules that seem to be working. Why can't we replicate? Um, especially around choice. Choice, you know, we, we talk, hear a lot about school choice, especially in this warped Betsy DeVos way. But we've had school choice in this country for a long time. If you uh, were rich, you could go to private school. And if you were rich, you could buy a house on a nice zip code. And the minute that the benefits of choice are to poor families, as they have through the charter movement, like as progressives, that's something we should celebrate. But I will say the answer, and you'll hear different things, but one of the answers, and we already brought it up, is, is unions. And also people who don't. What about unions? Well, for example, them, for, well, no, but for example, this is seniority, right? The way that we hire teachers, place teachers, and fire teachers, and pay teachers in elementified and in districts, traditional districts throughout the state, is based solely on seniority. If you sign your contract a minute before someone else, then you get first choice of where you're gonna go, and if you get laid off, that other person gets laid off. Uh, charter schools have realized, oh, surprise, surprise, teaching is an, a really hard job, and it's a really important job, and if you have amazing teachers, you have great schools. And so they've said, let's actually reward quality, and not just age. Let's, in times of layoffs, let a principal say, you know what, this teacher hasn't been carrying his weight, but this teacher is amazing. Traditional districts haven't been able to do that, in part because the teacher's union hasn't been willing to come to the table. Let me bring this, I have two siblings who are teachers, one is a school social worker. So when you pay something on teacher's performance, sometimes a teacher is given a classroom of children who are supported at home, who have access to tutors, and then you get kids whose family life is a mess. So why would a teacher like my siblings have to, their performance, their, um, they're considered a quality teacher based on the form, performance of the students in their classrooms right. who that's, aren't that, that's, able that's, to. That's the crucial part of, of the, the debate around this, right? Especially around when you talk about linking teacher performance to their evaluation. Hey, we had this whole conversation under you know under the Obama administration um, about how you know how we would do that. And one of the great challenges is that you create this really powerful perverse incentive for teachers to not want to teach the most challenging students. If I'm going to be evaluated by the success of my students, I'm, if, if, I'm, if I'm looking purely as a, a human that generally is going to look in their own self-interest, I'm going to try and teach in a school that has exactly those families that are supported. There certainly are people who will, like like myself and, and like you, Nick, who have stepped in to and, and want to work with those most challenging students and want to do that. But when you're, again, you're comparing apples to oranges, we're two teachers, you're teaching in Brentwood and I'm teaching in Watts, and we're judged by the same standardized tests and the same scores. So, so and, and my evaluation is going to be based on the fact that my students didn't get to go to the museum and don't have jazz so, lessons and, and don't have tutors at home and don't get right well, violin. And this is where it's over here. And, and, and I, and I, I mean, that, that's the challenge. I have a few responses. One is let's incentivize our best teachers to teach in hard to staff schools, right? Which is something we don't do because but, 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 it means, but tying it, teacher it, performance it, to evaluate or student performance to, to evaluation it, does not do that. So few responses. One is the teachers union and folks maybe like Jason will say that we can't evaluate a teacher. It's so difficult. Ask a student and ask a parent which teacher do you want your kid to be in or which teacher do you want and everyone will tell you right and maybe one of the difficulties is quantifying the art of this is a great teacher into the science That's but there are ways to, there are ways to do it and we don't say oh you know, I'm not going to be a lawyer or a criminal defender because I always get the guilty kid, right? Look, there's ways to evaluate based on growth. So one of the things that we've talked about about teacher evaluations is if you're talking about student achievement, growth. When my kids came to me, I diagnosed them. Most of my seventh and eighth graders were reading below a second grade level. The ones that I was able to move up to a fifth grade level, that's great. A few were struggling. 
based, you know, don't judge me on the eighth grade level because none of them are going to get there in that year. But look at growth. Also look at other things like teachers, uh, peer surveys. What do other teachers think about me? Principal evaluations, parent feedback, student feedback. Am I also contributing to my school as a coach? Every profession, every profession, including what you all do, probably gets evaluated. And if you're not good at your job, you can get fired. And you might not think it's perfect, and you know nothing's going to be perfect. But this idea that we can't evaluate one of the most important professions, um, to me, is just ludicrous. And it's, it's, it's the thing that has kept this off the table, because we say, oh, it's hard, and oh, what about the rich kids? Well, there are ways to, to compensate for that. And, and that's, I mean, that's exactly the point that we sort of talk, we may agree more than we disagree. I mean, that, and I'm certainly not saying that we shouldn't evaluate teachers and that it's this impossible profession to evaluate. I'm saying that tying it to strictly to, to student performance or having student performance be part of an evaluation creates a perverse incentive and that it, to convince me otherwise would be a real challenge because it does that and teachers, as was brought up by the moderator, the teachers see that. Maureen. But more thanks more. Thank you. I just I don't buy it, Jason, because I think that that's like you know oh well it's a in any profession then there's a perverse incentive to like start at the bottom so you can go up if you if you accurately um, create a measurement based on growth absolutely if and if, not if, just if, as we, if we create the measurements in appropriate ways we did over the last three years at the department have created a new you know multiple measures dashboard that honors growth that that is looking at at school performance in a very different way than the traditional academic performance index did math and English test scores and looking at a broad Broader set of indicators with growth as one of those options, and showing and allowing schools and someone like me who also works in our awards unit and how we recognize you know high performing schools for years. Brentwood and Santa Monica, anybody who was over that 800 in the academic performance index, were our gold ribbon schools, where our you know our, our highest performers were honored. But how do we honor those that are serving our most challenging students and honor that growth? If you can get an eighth grader reading a second grade level up to fifth in one year, you ought to be celebrated. But the system previously didn't allow for that, and we're shifting in this state. We're shifting in that direction. I think that's a very positive. Thing. Can I bring up a point here? You know, also too, having siblings who are teachers, it's not just about getting their grades to a certain level or. or, or the academics, you have the heavy girl who's being bullied by the other kids, and then you have the, the slower student, and my sister says you have to put them in groups where you're really trying to grow them, and you have to be more concerned about so many emotional issues. And you know, and then you get the crazy parent who comes in and says, you seated, you made the tables look like a swastika. sticker. This happened to my sister. She's like, what? I'm grouping kids. So you get the crazy parents, and then you say kids first. Whose kids first? The pushy parents' kid first. So you're dealing with emotional issues too, on all levels, not just the, po the kids from poverty, the kids from divorce, the kids from violent families, alcoholic families. So how do you deal with that? Because that's a whole other layer than zip codes. Well, this goes, I mean, it goes to a few things, and I think where Jason and I are going to agree when it comes to more funding for our public schools is to bring nurses and counselors back to schools. You know, the uh, American Association of School Counselors recommends one counselor for about 450 students, which still is a lot. LAUSD is about one to 800 which means that your counselor is you know, dealing with 800 kids all with similar problems. Our schools don't have nurses. Uh, most schools what? have nurses. They don't no, have nurses? They don't have nurses. Most schools have nurses for like maybe an afternoon. So if you're sick on Wednesday from 1 to 4, great. If not, don't bother. Oh my god, how are you going to get out of class? Well, and this is true when, you know, <laughs> right? Exactly. It's terrible. All your whole like putting your head up to a lamp doesn't work anymore. But part of this is because California ranks about 45th out of 50 in per pupil spending. And this is a larger issue, goes back to Prop 13 and others. But LA Unified gets half per student uh, as New York. So we get about $10,000 per student. New York is in the 20s. Baltimore is like 25, 26. So one of the, I, you know, one of the things I ran on is, is more budgetary transparency and more efficient spending. And I think when we're paying teachers based on age in the classroom and not um, performance, then we're not using our money wisely. But one area where we agree is we're, we're fighting over scraps. And when we don't have money for nurses and counselors and college counselors, a lot of these things are getting left on the laps of teachers. The other element of this, I think, is, is teacher training, which is a whole other issue that I think maybe there's some alignment, is our schools of ed really need to um, be held to higher standards so that when you are you know, maybe not dealing with all the myriad of problems, but grouping. Uh, you know, heterogeneous versus homogeneous grouping and ability grouping and differentiating instruction and scaffolding, all these terms are things that we should really be teaching in our schools of ed. And I think when we look at the training that some teachers are getting, it just hasn't adapted to the times. I think there's a lot on the teachers too, though. There's an awful lot put on this. Absolutely. And as, you know, as Nick just said, there's a lot put on, on teachers and there's, there's 
different social emotional needs depending on you know socioeconomic strata, right? I mean, drug overdoses are more common in you know in, in high income areas, and and sort of trauma informed systems and trauma issues are more prevalent in. in um, in low-income areas. So there's social-emotional needs across the system, and teachers are so much more than just teachers, and with so many of the, the resources that most of us remember from school, counselors, nurses, you know, the, even the lunch lady, things like that, there were, there were so many, um, there, was, there were more resources around students uh, previously, and I would, you know, I would, would not argue that the, 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 the system of evaluation and the system of um, of sort of last in first out and some of those you know, or first in you know, first in first out um, last in first out thank you so are, you know that are 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 things that really support the system age is not the best indicator of success we need to find better ways to do that but we also need to create a system where you know, if you, you know is the system broken sure there are pieces of it that need to be tweaked I think the you know teacher education and, and you know education in general is one of those policy areas that it's it's sort of founded in these bureaucratic institutions and these, you know, this this agrarian society model. I mean, summer was based on students leaving and working, you know, working in the fields to, you know, support farms. Well, they're going to have to start doing that again soon. Well, maybe, right? <laughs> but they, but that, but so the system has not has not evolved. And we started this model of charter schools in California a generation ago. But we have not. We have. We have. We set that system up in a way where you were focused on competition and you were focused on. You know, again, competition in a system that isn't equal instead of looking at how do we look for more collaboration. Educators are by nature collaborators. That's what they have to do to work together. You've got to have vertical integrated teams between a middle school and a high school. You've got to have horizontally integrated teams where all your English teachers are talking together. The, I mean, teachers collaborate. They're lesson planning. They're working together. And how have we not created a system in California where these, you know, people who are, who are excited about charter schools, excited about education, excited about the reform movement and innovation aren't incentivized to actually work with and collaborate with traditional districts so that the 9% of students in charter schools aren't getting something different than the 90% of the students that are left in traditional public schools and that we aren't comparing apples to oranges when we see a, a district like Inglewood Unified, where I've been spending a lot of time lately, that's seen you know 1,600 of their students in the last few years be peeled off by charter schools. And during that time, the percentage of special ed, special needs students who are very expensive to educate has grown not because of over identification or not because anything has changed the number of special ed students in the district is essentially the same but the total number of students and the total dollars coming into the district has shrunk so that encroachment of those very expensive needs of students is increasing as charter schools and and, and private schools are taking peeling more students well, off I think this, this but, but they're not taking their fair share not intentionally but because of the way the system is designed they're not taking their fair share of special needs students which is creating a greater burden on the public Public, traditional public school that has both the children of parents who didn't know there was a charter school and weren't the parent that took the the proactive parent who's engaged in education right. enough right. to, so to, to get a into a charter school and special needs students that are responses. left with fewer resources. I think so you're one, not comparing apples to orange. You're not comparing apples to apples. A lot of one, going on here. So one is that it, it, some of this is, is inherent in Jason's answer about the encroachment. There's been a there's been a feeling that money belongs to districts and bureaucrats and the State Department of Education. And when a char when a student goes to Santa Monica Unified or a charter school or chooses another option, that they're stealing that money. There's also a uh, philosophy of which I ascribe, which is that you know we fund schools so that children can have a great education. And if a child decides to go to another school, money's going to follow that child. And so this idea of, oh, you're, you're stealing our students. No, the parents are making a choice that based on their needs, they have found a better option. So my response, as now the LA Unified, is like, let's ask them why they're going and try to improve our schools. No one has done that. They've tried to shut down the competition. I mean, and you look at this innovation. You know, not a perfect analogy at all, but if you look at the postal service, right? Well, things that have evolved in the postal service, tracking packages. Um, actually, there's really interesting history, the innovations in the postal service, which I won't get into now. But tracking packages came from FedEx, and then UPS did it, and then the postal service did it, right? We don't see that low. We should look at these charter schools and look at longer school days, and how do we bring that in? And I think part of it, though, with this idea of collaboration is to like is to free districts and schools from the red tape. If you, I should have brought my copy of the state ed code, which Jason's office administers, and it's you know this big, and you have things in there that say 
that um, you know a, a teacher can't operate a library without a credentialed librarian. Well, we've had these layoffs since 2008. We don't have enough librarians. Libraries in South LA have been shut down because not because we don't have books, but because we have the state law that says you can't operate a library. And, and we also and, have. And I just want to be very clear. I administer that code, but that code comes from the legislature. We are told what to do, and there's and after working in the legislature and then the department, that's a challenge. But I would also just just one point. You know, not not at all arguing. Um, that you know that there is not a that there is there is not the need for that. I would actually argue that we agree on this point. The innovations need to be coming into the public system, and we need to be to be working. We need to be working harder to do that. But the, no, I never said that. Just the the charters or anyone else is stealing money, and I would encourage any of the traditional public school advocates that are using that term. That's not the point. But here's the reality of a bureaucrat administering a school district. If a hundred students, if I have a district of nine thousand students, and a hundred of those students leave at ten thousand dollars a student, that's a million dollars that just left my budget. That's a million dollars of cost less you right. have too. No, it's not because you can't. With when a hundred well, students leave, this is the leave, problem with LAUSD. If, here's the deal: if, 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 if different if, schools, if, if two yes. students, two kidding, students, but, two but students leave from this classroom and two from that classroom but and two from that classroom point because two from that classroom, LA Unified, you can't just lay off ten teachers. You can't just fire the principal. Your total dollars shrunk, but your general operating costs did not. And, and that's, that's a reality of administering a school district that is not about anyone stealing money, but something we need to look at when we're, when we're talking about the competition of students equaling dollars. And, and that's, year, that's part of the and, issue. And in one year, yes, in a one-off year, yes. But LA Unified has lost 100,000 kids in the last decade. It's because of charter schools, but also the cost of living has pushed people out of LA, right? That's on all of us. And uh, demographic trends, birth, live births are lower. We're losing about 2% a year because people just aren't having so babies. So the money's not coming in. And the money's not coming. But in those 100,000 years, our, in those 100,000 students, in the last 10 years, our administrative costs have gone up. So yes, Jason's right. If one student leaves each school, you have a challenge. But over 10 years, when districts have lost 10% of their students, they needed to make hard decisions, consolidate schools, do some layoffs. And because of these, in some cases bureaucratic, in some cases union protections, that hasn't happened. And so now we're left in this kind of death spiral, as some advocates have been calling it, where every year you're losing some students, you have to keep the lights on, you have increasing costs because of poor planning. Yeah, I wanted to talk about, we're talking about the finances here, and we've talked about academics. What I would like to know is, are the public schools doing anything right? And some of the things that you're advocating for, um, you know, not all kids are um, going to be academically, um, you know, advanced. And you don't have the guidance counselors to help those on the fence get into maybe even a county uh, college to, to reach their potential in that way. There is very little vote tech or the arts anymore for a uh, student who may be so inclined. So those are issues, but I want to know what the schools may be doing right to help some of these students who are both academic and not so inclined. I always try to make a distinction between school individual schools and the system. Um, I think the system is broken, that's my argument here, that's why I ran for the school board. But I think individual schools are doing amazing things. And teachers, like our hardest working professionals among them, and all of our school employees, our plants managers, I mean, are doing incredible things in the classrooms. And they're doing it with limited resources and with not enough support from the system. And that's what I would like to see change. But they're doing amazing things. You know, our uh, estimates are about a quarter of LA Unified students are undocumented or the parent doesn't need uh, children of undocumented immigrants. And our schools and our teachers have been on the front lines of not only making sure that our schools are safe places, providing resources for families, but also being that counselor. You know, yeah, maybe you come in with a headache, but what if you come into school and you not, you are worried that when you go home your parents it's may horrible. not be? Horrible. Our teachers are stepping up and our school communities are stepping up to do that. We are, be, our, our, because we haven't had the arts, our teachers are getting trained in the arts to kind of how do you integrate the arts into a project. So you're not just reading, um, Macbeth, but you're doing the play, and then you're doing the, the art project around it. Um, Macbeth is rough. Macbeth is rough. Just yeah. enjoy it's it. Rough. It's rough. Tomorrow, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. So, um, I think that our schools are doing amazing things, and, you know, I think that this other area of Jason and I is we just need to be sharing those practices, and that's really where it's school districts and the State Department of Education can help amplify those things and say, oh, look, you know, that school's doing an amazing job working with um, dual immersion programs in Mandarin. Like, 
this school is struggling. And that's, that's where we can see it. Right, and, and exactly. And you know, and that's when we talk about, you know, is public education broken? Does the system need updating? Does the system need to catch up to the 21st century? I mean, I mean, absolutely. But working for a state superintendent who has done nothing but exactly that, really focus on how do we find innovation? How do we how do we share best practices? You know, the, the number of task forces that we brought together during the first term of, of Superintendent Corbett's administration around career technical education, the arts, environmental literacy, civics education, you know, I mean, the, and, and the, the communities that came together across the state to say there are amazing things happening in charter schools, in traditional public schools, in magnet public schools, like, there are amazing things happening across the system. How do we share that and how do we create systems within districts and schools so that innovation isn't based on that one dynamic leader when that amazing principal leaves a school, everything falls apart. When an amazing superintendent leaves a district, everything falls apart. How do we put systems in place so that you're creating sustainable change? and celebrating the positive. And here's another thing we were pushing against the federal government, right? For the last, really, generation, instead of identifying schools in greatest need or greatest support, you know what we have to identify? We have to identify our failing schools. We have to tag schools in our state as failing versus those that need the greatest level of support. And the other thing California's done with our local control funding formula and, and Superintendent Torlakson and, and, and Governor Brown you know, sort of, you know, came together around that. We finally are funding schools Based on the based on needs of students, where we are looking at the students of the greatest needs and trying to concentrate funding into those communities, and that's something that again the system is evolving a little bit. It has we haven't lived up to that promise. I have to, but it's moving in the right we direction. We have to turn now to the audience in a moment. But what I want to ask both of you, I'm sorry, I have to cut. But here's the deal: I want to know, you know, as, as quickly as you can tell us, what can somebody do tomorrow? Because there are parents who are so involved. I mean, I'm the daughter of an immigrant. I'm one of six. My mother education was right there. But you know, most of these parents are assuming, you know, many are assuming the school's taking care of their child. They're not out researching which school is best, which teacher is best. They're just hoping their kid gets, you know, graduates and goes on to college, hopefully. So tomorrow, what can somebody do? We're talking policies, we're talking money, but tomorrow, what can somebody do? Well, so I was going to say, this isn't maybe tomorrow because we don't have an election tomorrow, but one is vote. You know, school board elections, about 10% of people vote, and yet uh, I now am one of seven who controls a budget of $8 billion and 600,000 students. So vote. Be nice. Um, J yeah, Jason's boss is, up, is, is termed out, and so in November of 2018, we'll have an election for the state superintendent of public construction. Get involved. And tomorrow, and this is actually one resolution our office is looking at, is we're trying to lower the barrier for people to get involved. Some of these bureaucracies and some of these old state and district policies really prohibit um, people from engaging with their local public school. If you go to your local public school, you might be told you have to go downtown and pay for fingerprinting and get eight background checks, and then you have to go to the... So, well, making sure that we're being safe and that, you know, we're not having people who haven't been probably vetted in schools. We're trying to kind of look at whether you're a person who wants to donate. We were, right now, there's no way to kind of, unless you're a parent at that school, maybe donate to an individual school. So you're saying the school board, get involved. Yeah, we're going to get, well, and also just like, we're going to uh, reduce oh. the barriers to entry so that you can go to your local school and say, I want to help read to kids, or I want to help uh, paint a mural, or I want to come and, uh, you know, help volunteer in a classroom. Uh, and right I mean, now there's, there's too many hurdles too many to do, that. to do that, so we're trying to reduce those. You're going to fix that. We're going to fix it. Okay, and what are you going to do? Um, I mean, I would agree with all of that. I mean, getting involved at that local level, if you're a parent with a student in schools, the get to know the teacher, understand what's going in that classroom, going on in that classroom, a personal relationship with a teacher, and an ability for uh, for that teacher to tell the parent honestly what's going on with their student and engage in that level is I mean, parent involvement is something that the, that the charter movement has really capitalized on and done so much better than the traditional you know public school of really. Um, all but requiring parent engagement in schools, and, it, and it's a, a huge indicator, you know, a huge indicator of success, uh, which is one of the sort of arguments people say, oh, they're creaming. It's like, really not. The parents are choosing that, um, and that's a, and, the, and that's, I think, an important thing. So as a parent, that's the most important thing for, you know, for the general public. I think I would agree with everything Nick said. You know, getting involved in elections, voting, you know, look, places like pro, you know, ProCon.org, you, know, pro, you know, getting out and and understanding the information, and not just sort of, you know, running out into the the wilderness of the internet, but but really going to some targeted sources for some information so that you can get involved in the debate because these issues are complex, um, but they also are really they really hit home. They're very personal. I mean, you know, you know, getting you know, you know, third grade, you know, third grade English teacher is a third grade English teacher, right? So it really is you know a human personal connection 
that, that I think is important and the things that I would advocate for, more arts in schools, more career technical education, art, music, and, and band, those are reasons that kids go to school. Those are, yeah, those are yeah, programs soul, like that increase that. attendance. Yeah. yeah, that's what students, okay. they want to go for those reasons. Kids are, again, ask the kids, they'll tell you. Um, and then the other piece is, this state says that essentially one third of us are gonna go to college and get degrees, right? 30, you know, the CSU and the UC system, about 33 to 36% are gonna go to college. Two thirds of the students that are currently in our K-12 schools are not going to go to college, and that's not a condemnation to failure. This, this, we need wonderful plumbers and good electricians and good HVAC operators and good mechanics and good dental assistants. We need people and abstract artists and, and, ab and abstract artists and musicians, and you, we need all of that radio to be host radio host totally, moderators. Totally. We need all those things to be a successful society. So to tell a student that if they don't get to go to Berkeley and get a French literature degree, they're a failure is is the wrong thing that we should be saying in society. We're going to turn now to, and I do hope those guidance counselors come get more involved and be able to hire more, because there's parents who uh, don't another, speak for their kids. I need a lot of volunteers, especially the folks who have gone, have gone to college, if you've written a college application essay, you can really help a lot of our students who don't have that support in the school. Uh -huh. so we'll be looking at ways to kind of... Somebody who can write, so. not the blind leading the blind. All right, let's take out some... Do you want to take my... Okay, do you have a vision? Yeah. It's a wire. Questions. Sir, here. Well, in, in terms of what you can do tomorrow, tomorrow I am on the founding board of a charter school that's preparing for LACO to try and get an authorization to operate in Inglewood. And that's because in Inglewood we got turned down. What we discovered is that like, there is a lot of resistance from these schools to say charter. And if you read the LA Times, you watch 16 minutes, or you can watch John Oliver on HBO. Every charter school story is about a charter school that is uh, living off the system and really screwing up the kids and parents. So I guess the question would be what can be done to kind of turn that around at the, the locations where the schools or the, the communities are most in need of this kind of help? So there's we can't be like this guy. So there's sort of two two points to that question. One thing, you know, what, how can we turn that tide? Nick and I were talking a little bit, you know, before we came up here. Really getting people to get into the room that have been on on opposite sides of this of this conversation, bring both sides to the table. And I think in in the same way that sort of folks would say the traditional sort of union, you know, and advocates have been, you know, recalcitrant, the charter school advocates have been, you know, really hard to move on putting in some protections and so the for the ability of, of an entity like the Department of Education to monitor those bad actors. And I think if, if both sides, because they do exist, but obviously that shouldn't be everything we're seeing in the media, because there's amazing charter schools. There's wonderful things that are happening out there. But there's the the inability of both sides to sort of to to critically look at the challenges on and the you know a teacher that maybe in the classroom 25 years not as good as that teacher that's been in the classroom six years and is doing a great job with their first one out. The unions have, have been you know unwilling to have some of those conversations, but the charter school advocates have been just as unwilling to have conversations about about reforms in um, in essentially oversight and accountability for fear that they would be sort of used against them, right? They would be used negatively. So and and that might be rightly placed fear, but bottom line is both of those sides have got to start looking at the the totality of their sort of ecosystem and and look at that critically and be willing to come to the table and say hey we, we do want to put some safeguards in place and some accountability and oversight in place to make sure that we can remove those bad actors from the charter management organization world so that those so that those articles leave the leave the you know the new the, the press and then we also want to be doing the same on the other side so that we can have the best and the brightest teachers in the classroom teaching our kids so if both sides are willing to to look at their things they haven't been we can we can come to some conclusions that I think it, it'd be a give-and-take policy debate about what sort of oversight reforms would we give up so that the unions might give something up and how could we come together on some solutions that would be better for kids. Right. We got, let's see what we want to get a yeah. bunch more questions well, and we only have 10 minutes. I was going to say the other thing too and this is in terms of what you can do and what ProCon can do is really advocating for campaign finance reform because the biggest spenders in this fight are the California Teachers Association, the Teachers Union which is the biggest lobby in Sacramento and then the Charter Schools Association which is catching up and so they're spending you know tens of millions of dollars a year um, 
my election was actually the most expensive non-mayoral municipal race in American history. Eleven million dollars were spent on this school board. Race. Is that your money? Not mine. Even though money was just flying over here. Um, and so part of that is when you when those lobbies are the teachers union and the charter schools, what's getting lost is like those of us in the middle who, to Jason's point, actually agree with like you know, that compromise requires both sides to kind of give in. So some of that is campaign finance reform and voting so that you can actually say, I'm not a charter person or a union person that you want to be in the middle. Okay, let's see how many questions we can get in and, and as succinctly we can answer them. So I'll try and get to this. Uh, oh. <laughs> so, uh, so my question to you is, uh, I mean, you're telling us that voting is really important and that's how we can make a, a, a change in the system, but uh, I run something called the LA Civics Initiative and I had a student point out this recently. Uh, we're pumping out kids 18 as adults into the world and asking them to do exactly that without having done any due diligence in their educational system to teach them about what to vote on, how the system works. I teach at a local university, I had one student in my class know who the mayor of Los Angeles was. They don't know the difference between the California state legislature and the federal legislature. And yet, once they're adults, we're blaming them for not voting. You, you just said that, that, that your uh, race had an ex exorbitant amount of money spent on a 10% turnout. What are we doing to fix that? So, yeah, civics is no longer part of most public school curricula. Actually, in California, you have to, in high school, take a civics course. Um, but, you know, we, uh, this week is actually voter in engagement week where we're trying to, in high schools, do voter registration drives. We've talked about a school district can actually have the students vote um, at 16 as a way to kind of get them excited about voting earlier. You know, to me, it starts in some ways with really great civics history teachers. It looks at, um, reducing the barriers to uh, registration voting across the board. I mean, we make it as a country really difficult to vote. Uh, so California has led the way in kind of automatic registration. In, um, we talked about you know mobile polling places. One of the things that's difficult for people to vote is on a weekday uh, when you have to vote during work hours. So making voting a holiday, doing it over the weekend, uh, doing early voting. Uh, Get, eventually get into a system where you can potentially vote online or in the short term have mobile polling places so you can, it's, it's still a paper ballot but you don't have to be at one polling place but to your education piece it really I mean it, it's bringing civics back in the curricula I think it would be great as a high school graduation requirement to have to take the citizenship test right I think most people wouldn't be able to pass the citizenship test um, but maybe Jason can talk too because it is a California requirement to take a civic it, it is there is some civics education in California so I sit on the leadership council for what we call the power of democracy steering committee which is which came out of a, a civics education task force that the superintendent um, you know, brought together from folks around the state in his first term and one of the things that, that we're seeing and doing is trying to again elevate those best practices trying to honor schools that are doing the right things that are you know encouraging teachers you know high school you know history and, and social studies teachers to, to have to take part in mock trial to be part of model UN to really bring and those are things that are fun that kids want to be involved in right it gets them out of a book it gets them engaged in a hands-on way but it's it's about education I mean polling places and, and online registration all of that is excellent to get people out but making sure that students have the skills I would say debates like this to be able to critically think about the issues when you're making a decision it's huge and schools need to again take a, a bigger responsibility in that and we've been been working to do that in the best way that we knew, knew how again, given the current funding structure and some of the challenges was to really highlight best practices on our schools that are doing good, good things encourage them to do more and then partner with the chief justice and other folks in the um, in the legal community to, to to partner with schools to bring students to courthouses to bring students you know to those mock trial type events again anything you can do to give students a hands-on experience of of what it is to engage in our democracy Democracy, engage in civics is going to be helpful and schools and, need and to do more of it no question and we need to convince all voters but students especially of the relevancy of their elected officials right a lot of people didn't know we had a school board uh, and a lot of people don't know I mean they talk a lot about the presidential election but when it comes to like homelessness and when it comes to crime and when it comes to affordable housing that's city councils and that's school boards and so part of it is is not just educating them about go vote but like here's who your decision makers are and here's who to hold accountable Um, you, you, you both sort of are accepting as an action charter schools of the way that the questionable axioms are related. So, educators who say, you know, we only pay on average, no better. 
there's a mantra that private is better than public. That mantra is also a So I think the, the question was about charter schools are not a good, they're not a bad, private versus public. And I think a few things, yes, one, when we have to talk about the LA context versus the national context. Uh, LA, nationally charter schools are on average, no better, no worse. There are also different types of models. There are private, there are for-profit charter schools. In LA, we have exclusively non-profit charter schools. So non the charter school operators are maybe a network, uh, like a little school district of non-profits or a one-off parent charter school. They also, in the study that I would go to, is, is the Credo Center at Stanford University, uh, does a study every few years and have shown that urban charter schools in LA outperform our district schools. Um, so I think the context is important. I also think it's important to remind people that charter schools are public schools. That charter schools are just a different type of uh, public schools. We have, you know, Jason mentioned magnet schools. We have a lot of different innovation right now in education. We have your traditional neighborhood school, a magnet school. We have a pilot school, which is kind of like a charter school, but within the district and teachers run it. We have what have been called I design schools, um, and we have charter schools. So, you know, I don't think that private is better. I think it's innovation and this flexibility is better. I think that private pu public partnerships are something that we've lost a lot in this country and is a good thing. And so, you know, you look at this iPhone. I mean, the, the technology here was Department of Defense, right, government, touch technology, GPS, the touch, but I wouldn't want a government-issued phone, right? It was Apple and, and, and Samsung if they're not blowing up anymore. So that partnership to me is like we have innovation from some of these nonprofits that are able to go around the world and say this is working, but the government should be running schools or overseeing schools. So one of the things, you know, we oversee in 250 charter schools, and I've been trying to change the dichotomy from those are charter schools and these are our schools to we're all public schools. Let's take credit for our oversight um, because part of our job is we're the elected officials who oversee this. So if a charter school is being a bad actor, it's on us to shut them down. And we're actually working on a resolution right now to ban for-profit charter schools and to expedite the process for shutting down low-performing schools. What I would like to see is that level of uh, accountability in district schools. And that's to, to Jason's point about what we learn from. A charter school every five years has to get approved by a school district. And if it doesn't get approved because it's not meeting its goals, it's not doing well, it's incumbent on districts to shut them down. There are the vast majority of public schools that are operating without any of that accountability. So my goal would be, let's look at some of that accountability and bring it to the public schools, the traditional schools. Do we have another question? This is our last question. Our last question. Uh, neither of you touched on this. There was a lot of issues that were brought up and they were all very important. But let's start with the fundamental thing at the very top. The school district, the whole system is too big to try and serve the needs of so many people in such a diverse population is what's resulting in a lot of the problems that you talk about. All the layers of management, all of the issues and the whole tenure situation and, and what created the union in the first place. So what can you do to just tear the whole thing apart and start again? So I, I would say we, we started to do that to some degree with the local control funding formula and the local control accountability plans. Governor Brown's vision around that is what he, call, he calls a vision of subsidiarity, that the, the unit of government closest to the people, the city council or your school boards, are should be making decisions about about really everything, but policy and funding. So the state really, in exchange for this this weighted student formula, where we're weighting more resources towards you know, students of greater need, gave districts more flexibility um, in how they, they took, used, we used to have categoricals, right? You had to spend this money on physical education, this money on special education, this money on career technical education, this money on nurses, you know, and that, that those categoricals are essentially gone now. So, so local districts have much more flexibility and they're required to then create a kind of local account accountability plan that's approved by the board that should have, you know, in a, in a perfectly implemented world, input from parents, input from community members, you know, input from their business community and, and, and city partners. And so there's, we're shifting to that model of, of local is, local is better. Um, I think in a state like California, given the disparity of income, you know, sending the money to the state and then redistributing it back to schools based on need is a better model than just funding schools locally. I, I would argue that really to, to the core because otherwise you, you, just, you just increase the inequities and the inequalities. But, but to, to, to have that 
to, to have that control at the local level is important. And another, there's 10,000 school districts in California, right? So there are there are thousands of single school, one school room, one schoolhouse districts across the state. And then there's LA Unified, right? And San Diego Unified, and Oakland, and you know, and Inglewood, which has 18 schools and 9,000 students. Now that's not a, a behemoth of an organization to run, right? You know, Santa Ana, 40,000 students. You know, that's that's a there, there are some reasonable size organizations for highly qualified administrators and executives to run and manage as, as school districts. Um, one of the things that I think we've done poorly in education is to train administrators as managers and executives. I mean, often, right, teacher gets promoted to vice principal, they become a principal, they become an assistant soup, they become a superintendent, and someone who was trained to, you know, a four-year credential, you know, to be a third grade English teacher is now an administrator of a school district with 800 employees and 30,000 students, and that's a whole different world than being in a classroom. So thinking about administrator training and executive training and what it means to manage that type of organization, and those sizes vary, again, from single school room to 8,000 students to 20 to 600,000. So this is another area where I think we agree, but one of the reasons that you have these great teachers and great school leaders going to these positions in the bureaucracy is because the only way we give people more money is if they keep going up this chain. The, during the LAUSD school building project in the early 2000s, the head architect was a fourth grade English teacher who just got promoted, had no architectural experience. So I think we agree. I love this threat on like, you know, running a school is a lot different than running a classroom. Running a school district is a lot different than running a school. So we need to, but we need to incentivize that. Um, you know, I also, I think the goal is, is to get to a, a more decentralized, I'm really glad Jason used the subsidiarity principle. Um, there are more kids in LAUSD than people in the state of Vermont. Right, LA County, if it were a state, would be the fourth largest state in the country. The only states larger than LA County would be California, Texas, and New York. So I think you need to break it up which is your question. The, the reason you can't do it tomorrow, I think, is the collateral damage to students and classrooms tomorrow as that's happening. So what we're trying to get to with the local control funding formula, which I think needs to be implemented more quickly and with more fidelity to the formula, because right now the largest driver of cost is still teacher salaries, which are still driven by seniority. So schools don't actually, if schools have to budget within their means, then they would have to reallocate teacher salaries. So we're trying to get there so that we can get to a point where you have all these kind of autonomous schools as opposed to a school district. I would love to get there tomorrow. I just think until you have thought that through, which we're working on, uh, we got to think about the kids who are there. But that's the goal for me is, you know, at the end of a term or at the end of 10 years to say that we have a, a system of schools rather than a school system in LUSD. Yeah. Okay, we have to wrap this up, but what I was going to ask you, in summation, they each have a minute, which I don't know if you can keep this topic to a minute, but most of this discussion seemed like a, a lot of agreement. So in closing, if you could state what your point is and how that differs from Nick's and vice versa. So let's start with you, Jason Spencer. So the, for me, the main point is that it was really just hit on here. So there's other states have done what we call, what they've called teacher TLC teacher leadership and compensation. So keeping good teachers in the classroom by compensating, by having a career path for teachers, for the best teachers to stay in the classroom to support students instead of the only way to get a raise is to move into administration and out of the classroom. So I think that's one key piece we can do, but it's not public education that's broken. Public education works in so many places, and as Nick said, charter schools are public schools and they are working. Magnet schools are innovation in a traditional public system that are working, and there are public schools across this state that are working. There are the most challenging populations that we're dealing with in concentrated numbers of students that have been impacted by trauma and sort of across communities that need our attention and need the best and the brightest teachers. And we do need more flexibility for, for managers of school districts to be able to make evaluation decisions and to do that. But it's not public education that's broken. It's a system that needs updating for the 21st century. Your response, sir. Well, I don't. I, I think I agree. I mean, that's to me. But to me, that kind of shows proves the point, which is that you know when you have uh, LA looks different today than 10 years ago, which is that there is a really great public school in almost every community in LA. The problem is there needs to be a lot more and a lot faster because we are losing generations of students. Uh, only, you know, LAUSD has inflated their graduation rates. And so we had a historic graduation rate of 80%, but only 47% of our kids are graduating even eligible to attend college. Only 25% of our students are graduating from a college within six years. To me, when you have schools in every community that are dramatically outperforming schools down the street, be that a charter school or a magnet school, pilot school, and you are not working with extreme urgency to say, how do we get more of that school, and how do we shut down that school, or how, then you're not 
fixing the problem. And I think my issue with the, with the Department of Education or with the bureaucracy of the unions is that there's this still willingness to say there are all these other issues, which there are, you know? But the school as the unit of change for elevating kids out of poverty, uh, we know you can do it. Uh, and, and maybe it takes a little more money, you know, which I think we agree on. Maybe it takes some innovation. Maybe it takes more parent engagement. But if we know we can do it and it's working for certain kids, uh, then we need to be doing it for all kids. And, and that's where we're trying to accelerate the pace of change. Well, I, I want to thank both uh, Jason Spencer and Nick Malvoin for being here. Next time we're going to include somebody who believes in homeschooling so that we can really have um, really a, a screaming match. No, I'm kidding. But um, they're doing a lot. And I applaud both of you for the fine work you're doing. Uh, Jason is the principal advisor to the California State Superintendent of Public Instruction. Nick Malvoin, a member of the Los Angeles Unified School District of Education. Give them both a really uh, good round of applause. Really, thank you both. I mean, it's terrific. It, it's, it's an education. The other thing is I want to give a huge shout out to Pro Con. I took, go to their website. It is such a, a huge resource of knowledge and civil discourse and so many different topics that you can delve into. So I, I hope you'll go there and support what they're doing because we really need this more than ever right now. Thank you. Make, I make all of you. Thank Maybe you, you came much. from the sunset. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. Let's have a hand for Maureen, too, for a great job moderating. Thank you. Um, Thanks for coming tonight. Before you leave, please stop by and cast a vote so we can see if your opinion changed or your intensity of your opinion changed. And come back next week, Monday at 6 p.m. We'll be here. We'll be talking about housing in L.A., densification, gentrification, and why the rent is too damn high. So we'll have another debate next week.